Hey folks, welcome to a brand new edition of Smart Money. The biggest headline this week was undoubtedly the meteoric rise of the Bitcoin. Look at that, the Bitcoin hit a record high of $40,000 this week and in less than a month, the Bitcoin has doubled. So on the show this week, we decode the breathtaking journey of cryptocurrencies and answer all those questions in your head about the Bitcoin. Is it still worth a buy? Is it legal? What are the risks? How do you trade it? And is it a scam? Let me introduce the guest on my show today. Nishal Shetty is the founder of Wazirx, India's largest cryptocurrency exchange trading platform. Nishal will do a complete end-to-end -end explainer for us on the mysterious asset class. And just a caveat here, his view could be a bit biased, right? Considering he's running a trading platform of cryptocurrencies. Okay, Nishal, thank you so much for being with us on the show. You know, ever since we put out this uh, uh, so, sort of show topic on social media, we've got inundated with questions. So let's start from the top. What is a cryptocurrency? If I've missed the bus, how do I trade it, you know, as an Indian in India? And what are the risks involved? Sure. Uh, thanks a lot for having me on the show, Sonia. I think the uh, first thing, so whenever people ask me what's a cryptocurrency or what is Bitcoin, uh, I li like to give a simple example. So think about you today, if you wanted to make an online uh, money transfer to your friends you have to instruct your bank to make the money transfer. Then your bank makes that transfer to your friend. So what's happening in this online money transfer is that you are involved, your bank is involved and your friend. So that's a three party system. Mm -hmm. But if you were to do the same thing offline, you would just hand over a 100 rupee note to your friend and uh, that's the transfer that happened between you and your friend. That's called a peer to peer transfer. Mm -hmm. In Bitcoin, the innovation of Bitcoin is that it made that cash transaction possible online. So today when you send a Bitcoin to your friend, it's just between you and your friend. There's no third party involved. And this innovation is what uh, has given rise to this meteoric, uh, you know, last 10 years of meteoric rise for Bitcoin is the whole fact that there's such a great innovation where a third party is not needed for transactions between two people. Okay. So yeah, that's the whole uh, thing. Now on top of that, uh, there are so many applications that you can build which we'll talk about through the show. Okay, so I think the first thing that you said is there's no third party involved, but you know, that's where the questions arise, right? I mean, is it even legal? That's the most popular question that I got because people are afraid to put their money into something where there is no regulation, there's no body that regulates it. So on the legality aspect, I mean, what would you want to clarify? Yeah, I think this confusion about uh, legality comes from the fact that there was in between from 2018 uh, to recently till March 2020, there was a banking uh, restriction on cryptocurrencies. Mm -hmm. So people thought that that was a ban, but uh, that was not a ban. That was a banking restriction, which again, the Supreme Court uh, ruled against it. So now uh, there's no such restriction as well. So it's perfectly legal for you to buy Bitcoin. In fact, uh, the fact that uh, we are running our exchange Wazirx in India, uh, is testament to that, that it's legal for you to buy or sell crypto. Okay, so guys, a big yes here. It is legal for you to buy yourself any kind of cryptocurrency, right? Uh, is it regulated? No. Will it be regulated? Maybe. So that is another issue, right, that people face. I mean, there's no regulation. Why should I invest my money? What would you want to say there? Uh, Look, Sonia, you know, the thing about if you look at technology as a whole, uh, usually technology comes first and then the regulations come. And that's true of anything that you use today. Every technology that touches your life, it has first come to you and then the regulators come in. So I would say the same story is being played out in the whole crypto ecosystem where crypto is just ahead in terms of technical progress. And I think over time, the regulators will come in. And it's a good thing if regulations come later because then the regulators can understand what's the right way to regulate. You cannot regulate something unless it's in the hands of people and people use it. So I think uh, right now it's an unregulated asset class, but eventually, definitely, I believe that uh, the world and India in general is going towards regulation. Okay, so the world is going towards regulation. Hopefully, it'll come to India as well. Now, I must mention at the onset that you you run a, 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 an exchange, right? A trading platform of Bitcoins and of cryptocurrencies. So, in a sense, your view is a bit biased. So, I, I just want to put that on board for people watching here. Let's go back to the different types of cryptocurrencies. We keep talking about Bitcoin and how it's hit 40,000. There's also Ethereum, which you know one of my colleagues was telling me has gone up 80% in the last one month. Um, if one had to start afresh, 
what would you recommend? Which is the cryptocurrency that is perhaps the safest and what is the difference? Look, uh, hands down, Bitcoin, it's not just the, uh, it's the oldest cryptocurrency and the first ever crypto. So I would say that the, and it's not just me recommending, it's data. The data says that almost 90% of people, they buy Bitcoin as their first cryptocurrency. So that's seen as like the entry point from not owning any cryptocurrency to owning your first cryptocurrency, it's usually Bitcoin. Yeah. Followed by Bitcoin, what happens is once people understand what Bitcoin is and what the crypto ecosystem is, then they get into exploring more ways. You know, it's like uh, you play that first video game and then you're bored and then you want to uh, find more new ways of uh, exploring uh, stuff. And that's the same thing that's happening in the whole ecosystem of cryptocurrency. Mm. And that's where Ethereum and all the other cryptocurrencies come in. Mm -hmm. And each has its own use case. So it's not like you're, you're not uh, buying a competition to Bitcoin or something. It, each has its own utilities and own use cases. So what you need to do is you need to research before you buy. And uh, if you think that the use case is something that would uh, be used in the future, then you would probably you know, go and buy those uh, different cryptocurrencies. Okay, so you did see the different cryptocurrencies on your screen as well. Bitcoin, everyone knows about. There's Ethereum, there's EOS, there's Cosmos. It's just a flash for you in a bit. Now, you know, there are a lot of misconceptions that we've been discussing, right, Nishal? Uh, one is, of course, is it legal? You cleared that out for us about the regulation, etc. The other thing is whether... Uh, you know, the most, I think the most popular line came from Bill Gates where he called it a Ponzi scheme. Uh, how would you want to react to that? And what are the other misconceptions that you generally get asked? And I mean, if you'd want to sort of debunk those myths. Sure, I think uh, see, see, uh, the most asked is usually the legality aspect, which we've cleared it's uh, completely legal for you to buy in India. Um, talking about Ponzi scheme or, you know, large, uh, I would say no names talking negatively. Uh, if you look at this whole innovation that happens, usually the early movers are in small numbers and they're positive, but the rest of the world is more or less negative about it. Uh, you, I, I was just uh, looking at recently, uh, SpaceX is making a lot of noise about you know innovation in the whole uh, uh, space exploration, but a lo long time back, Neil Armstrong uh, in fact said that uh, commercial space exploration may not be a good idea. So I think, uh, you know, there are misconceptions in the beginning, but eventually once you go deeper, you will realize that new technology needs time to be understood. So I think this is just that timing where uh, maybe in the, and it's the same with the internet, early days of internet, uh, parents used to tell their kids, don't sit on the internet. And today, knowing that uh, large internet companies are built, parents want their kids to get into uh, computers early on, maybe mm. even in school. So I think the same will happen with uh, cryptocurrencies, maybe five years down the line, we'll see everyone uh, getting into it early on rather than being late uh, entrance to that. But for people who are going to ask you, I mean, I'm sure you're getting a lot of questions now that, you know, sort of we've, uh, uh, cryptocurrencies has come into the mainstream. At 40,000 plus on the Bitcoin, Nishal, uh, hand on heart, do you, you do, don't you think prices are getting pushed up artificially? I was reading a, I was reading a report where CoinDCX is actually shutting down a lot of fraudulent accounts because there's a lot of pumping and dumping of the Bitcoin that's happening. Do you think it's safe at these prices for an average retail investor to buy Bitcoins? Look, uh, if you every uh, if you look at the history of Bitcoin, the good thing that you, you know when you want to look at uh, the price is you have a ten-year history of Bitcoin, and uh, there's always a peak. And when the peak hits, uh, people think that it's too overpriced maybe and uh, then there's a correction but then after a three to four years gap there's always a next peak and uh, history shows that the subsequent peaks are always far greater than the previous one so maybe today at this point when we look at uh, uh, thirty eight thousand dollars or a forty thousand dollars that might look like a lot but four years five years down the line when more people get involved and when more use cases come up this might seem like one of those uh, small blips in the whole big picture so I think uh, if you're looking at a long-term view, I don't think you have to worry. Uh, short term, there will definitely be fluctuations and that's how uh, the crypto ecosystem is trying to find the right price for Bitcoin. Uh, so in the short term, there will be, I would say a lot of fluctuation, but in the long term, it's all a, a matter of, you know, I think four to five years for these peaks to be overtaken. Okay, that's important. So you're saying, um, folks, don't drop your jaw with this kind of move that you're seeing. It perhaps could be the start of a big up cycle in, in the Bitcoin. Is that what you're saying? 
Uh, see, it's hard to say what direction it would go uh, because honestly, no one's seen what happens in a cycle like this. Mm -hmm. But like I said, the last when we look at let's say the last two peaks, the uh, you know it's there's been a 5x to 10x increase from the previous peaks. Mm -hmm. uh, so will it again replicate or will it uh, change direction? It's very hard to say. Okay, all right. You know what? We have plenty of questions, and in fact, as we speak, we're getting a lot of queries on our social media platforms as well. We're going to try and address all of them, slip into a very short break. We continue our discussion on this eye popping move in the cryptocurrencies on the other side. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to Smart Money. I think this is our most watched episode up until now because we're getting inundated with a lot of messages on the Bitcoin, a lot of your queries as well. We are speaking to Nishal Shetty, the founder of Vazirx, which is a, a cryptocurrency a trading platform, an exchange platform. And he was telling us before the break that, you know, don't be shocked by this move to 40,000 on the Bitcoin. It could just be the start of a big up cycle. Now, uh, I'm, we're getting a lot of questions. So I'm going to toss them straight to you, Nishal. Uh, what is the transferability of Bitcoin? So I guess what they're trying to ask is whether it can be used to purchase and if I own Bitcoins, uh, can I purchase something with it or is it an asset class like realty? I mean, what do I do with my Bitcoins if I can't use it as a payment option? Look, I think, uh, you know, if you want, wanted to understand the basic uh, use case of Bitcoin today, it's seen more as a store of value. Um, in a in a world where there's rapid inflation, what do people do? They they need to get into a asset class which is uh, deflationary. So gold is one, mm -hmm. and uh, Bitcoin seems to be emerging as the whole digital version of gold, mm -hmm. uh, simply because it has just 21 million supply, which is you know fixed. So people see that as one of those options for them. Instead of just being in, let's say, their uh, fiat currency, they want to move to a currency which or a asset which is deflationary. So Bitcoin is seen as that uh, asset class, I would say, a store of value where people want to uh, probably hedge their risks against uh, inflation. And that's usually the uh, biggest narrative around Bitcoin today. Okay, so is it accepted as a payment uh, form in, in many places? I know in India it is not just yet, but what, what about globally? I mean, where all is it accepted? Uh, is it used for remittances? Uh, what, if I buy a Bitcoin, what all can I use it for? Yeah, so, you know, uh, when it comes to payment, there are quite a few countries where it's accepted. I think Japan has been one of those early movers in this mm -hmm. space where uh, Bitcoin is accepted as payment. Then there are quite a few uh, credit card, debit card providers who accept, uh, you know, Bitcoin as your underlying asset for you to use then your card anywhere you want. Uh, in terms of, uh, I think, the remittance part that you said, that's a very uh, solid use case of Bitcoin because when we were talking about like a peer-to-peer -peer transfer. Today for remittances, you'll realize there are multiple um, middlemen involved and usually the data says that people lose about 8 to 10% of their remittance money by the time it reaches them. Mm. Uh, whereas if uh, they use Bitcoin, they don't lose anything because their near and dear ones can directly transfer it to their wallet. Mm. So uh, that's seen as a huge uh, a mover in the remittance space. It's still early days, but I think it's emerging as a strong player over there. Okay, emerging is a strong player as far as using it as a payment tool is concerned and some uh, countries like Japan have already started. Uh, you know, we are getting a lot of questions on what the biggest risks are that are associated with buying a Bitcoin. I think the most popular one is, uh, what about custody of my Bitcoin? If I'm making money, and I'm sure a lot of people who bought Bitcoin even two months ago are sitting on a lot of wealth, right? Uh, should I leave the Bitcoin with the exchange? Is it safe there or should I sort of transfer it into a physical form or into a paper form? I don't know. I mean, what, what about safe custody of the Bitcoin? See, I think uh, there's a beauty about uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies in general. The first thing is you have a choice. You have a choice whether you want to self-custody it mm -hmm. or you want a third party to custody. Now, mm -hmm. self-custody, I think the uh, things that you have to take care of is you don't lose your uh, wallet or your private key. Uh, but if you're going to go for a third party uh, custodial, you have to make sure that because it's an unregulated market, there's uh, uh, 
n number of uh, you know custodial products out there so you have to make sure that you trust the service provider um, and i would i usually recommend people that look into the backgrounds of the founders or the teams and how long that product has been in the market don't simply just move your bitcoin to like say something that you found on the top search result of google ask your friends and family understand uh, what are the products that have been in the market and then you can custody it with a third party but yeah both have their own downsides uh, when you do a third party custody go for two step uh, you know author authorization and all the other don't share your password with anyone hmm. so those are the standard uh, risk i would say uh, profiles that you should look at Okay, similar to what you do with as other asset classes, right? But at Vazirex, do you guys sort of uh, is there any uh, strict mechanism in which you prevent fraudulent accounts? I mean, is there any KYC that you you know that you enforce? How do you make sure that there is no artificial inflation of uh, the uh, the price? Right. So you, uh, right from day one, um, and though you know, point in uh, if you look at it, there's no regulation. Uh, do, no one has to. But right from day one at Vazirex, what we made sure is that we would uh, ensure there's KYC for every customer. Uh, the the benefit of that is you end up building a very clean ecosystem in India, and that was very very necessary because tomorrow when regulation comes in, we can show. to our regulators that we are already following certain uh, standards that usually uh, are not necessary but when you, when you do that you are creating a clean ecosystem so this fraudulent accounts and stuff uh, we take care that no one without kyc can trade on our platform so mm. that may, keeps the ecosystem clean and we'll continue to do that in fact uh, one of the things is uh, as part of uh, internet and mobile association of india we are coming up with a code of conduct so that mm. not just uh, one exchange in the country but any player in the ecosystem can adhere to those set of rules in the absence of regulation today okay you know what the bitcoin has really come into its own i just want to, uh, my director to pull up the previous plate about jp morgan's view on the bitcoin way back in 2017 jp morgan labeled the bitcoin a fraud a fraud currency and now in in i think for 3 years it says bitcoin will rise at the cost of gold as nishal was saying it's perhaps the new digital gold so well this is how opinions change right uh, following the ticker perhaps uh, the final question i don't think we have too much time so i'm going to take one last question nishal uh because it's at 40000 a lot of people are asking me what is the basis of the valuation of a bitcoin is it purely demand supply because i heard you mention earlier there are only 21 million bitcoins and as we know bitcoins are mined so there will be limited supply is it purely demand supply because of which the valuations are so high or is there something else at play No, you're right. Uh, it's purely demand and supply because Bitcoin is limited and it's a deflationary asset class. Uh, everyone knows that there will never be more than 21 million, and uh, out there there are over seven billion people on this planet. And maybe in right now, 50 to 60 million people have participated in the whole Bitcoin ecosystem. So the value that you see today is the value that is placed on the demand by these 50 to 60 million people. Now the thing is, in the next, let's say, three to five years, if this increases, the number of people into the Bitcoin ecosystem or crypto ecosystem grows to, let's say, 100 million, 200 million, or 300 million, accordingly, the prices will have to appreciate because there's not enough, uh, there's no new supply coming in, and the limited supply has to be distributed, and that's where it leads to a price rise. And this is a global price. Bitcoin's liquidity is global; it's not li limited to only one geography. So that's the uh, best thing about this. Okay, one last word from your end because uh, you know we've completely run out of time. At forty thousand today on the Bitcoin, where do you see it two years from now? Your best bet. Uh, so, Sonia, I, I think I, I look at uh, uh, I would say five year cycles, and uh, I believe. Uh, but again, I don't want to time it. But I believe that Bitcoin will cross a uh, hundred thousand oh, dollars. Maybe wow. it, it's two years, five years. I don't know the timeline, but I believe it will happen. Okay, all right. So that's uh, Nishal Shetty of Vazirex saying the Bitcoin at forty thousand dollars today could cross hundred thousand dollars in the next five years. But perhaps you want to take that with a pinch of salt because he does run in cryptocurrency exchange. Nishal, it was a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for debunking a lot of myths on the cryptocurrency and telling our viewers what they should be doing in case they miss the bus. With that, it is curtains down on another infotaining episode on smart money. We'll be back. with a brand new episode next week.